So you have, believe it or not, a little bit of frog skin in your eye, so to speak. Okay, not exactly, but you essentially have the equivalent of what frogs have in their skin in your eye. The brain uses about 40 to 50% of its total real estate for vision. That's how important vision is. There are ways in which you can use these same protocols that I will describe in order to preserve and even enhance your vision, your ability to see things and consciously perceive them. So the protocols we will describe have a lot of carryover to both conscious eyesight and to these subconscious aspects of vision. And I just want you to understand a little bit more about the science of seeing, of eyesight and vision, and then all the protocols will make perfect sense. So as amazing as eyesight is, it actually did not evolve for us to see shapes and colors and motion and form. The most ancient cells in our eyes and the reason we have eyes is to communicate information about time of day to the rest of the brain and body. Remember, there's no extraocular photoreception. There's no way for light information to get to all the cells of your body. But every cell in your body needs to know if it's night or day. If you are low vision or no vision, as long as you have retinas, it's very likely you still have these cells, even though you can't see or you don't see well. These cells, retinal ganglion cells, communicate to areas of the brain when particular qualities of light are present in your environment and signal to the brain, therefore, that it's early day or late in the day. These melanopsin ganglion cells are sometimes also called intrinsically photosensitive cells because they behave like photoreceptors. What do these cells respond to and why should you care about them? Well, you should care about them because they regulate when you'll get sleepy, when you'll feel awake, how fast your metabolism metabolism is, excuse me, your blood sugar levels, your dopamine levels, and your pain threshold. There are other factors that impact those things, but they are one of the, if not the most powerful determinant of those other things like mood and pain threshold, sleepiness, wakefulness, etc. If you are not viewing the sun, sunlight, even through cloud cover for two to 10 minutes in the early part of the day when the sun is still low in the sky and doing the same thing again in the evening, you are severely disrupting your sleep rhythms, your mood, your hormones, your metabolism, your pain threshold, and many other factors, including your ability to learn and remember information. The most central and important aspect of our biology and perhaps our psychology as well, is to anchor ourselves in time, to know when we exist. Okay, it sounds a little bit abstract and philosophical, but it's not. And we don't know time as a real thing because of watches and clocks. We know time at a biological level based on where the sun is and where, which of course is where we are relative to the sun because the earth is spinning. This is all subconscious. This is blue reflections coming off of sunlight. Blue light, we've been told, is so terrible for us. It is absolutely essential and wonderful for waking up the brain, for triggering all sorts of positive biological reactions, but it needs to be viewed early in the day. If you can't see sunlight because it's the thick cloud cover of, say, in a uh, you know, you're in the UK and it's winter, then artificial lights, especially blue lights, would be very beneficial to you. You need a lot of this light and its contrast with yellow in order to trigger these melanopsin cells, which would then trigger your circadian clock, which sits above the roof of your mouth, which will signal every cell in your body, including temperature rhythms, etc. So first things first, your visual system was not for seeing faces, motion, etc. The most ancient cells in your eye, which are there right now as we speak, are there to inform your body and brain about time of day so you want to get that bright light early in the day the conclusion has emerged that getting two hours a day of outdoor time without sunglasses blue light this blue light that everyone has demonized getting that sunlight during the day for two hours even if you're reading other things and doing other things outside has a significant effect on reducing the probability that you will get myopia nearsightedness. So remember your eye is an optical device. You were born with lenses. You don't have to use glasses or maybe you do because you have lenses in your eyes. 
And those lenses need to move. It's not a, it's not a rigid lens like a glass lens. It's a dynamic lens. It has little muscles that pull on it and squeeze it and make it thicker or thinner as you look at things close and far away. And I'll describe how that works in a moment. These melanopsin cells and their activation by sunlight, completely subconsciously, unaware, you're unaware of this, promote the health of this system within the eye and allow you to offset the myopia, nearsightedness. In other words, getting outside for two hours a day, each day, on average, even if there's cloud cover, without sunglasses on, will allow you to offset the formation of myopia. Now, you might still form myopia if you have certain structural features or genetic basis for that. We will talk about things that you can do as well. But for everybody, we should be doing this. And that might seem like a lot, but this is the way that your visual system works. Staying indoors, just getting artificial light, and looking at things up close leads to visual defects. Okay, it's a form of kind of like visual obesity, right? The, the posture of your visual system, if you will, is going to be unhealthy if you're just indoors and you're not getting sunlight early in the day and for at least two hours per day. The eye can dynamically adjust where light lands by moving the lens and changing the shape of the lens in your eye through a process called accommodation. And if you understand this process of accommodation, you not only can enhance the health of your eyes in the immediate and long term, but you also can work better. You'll be able to focus better on physical and mental work. You will be able to concentrate for longer. And I want to emphasize that so much of our mental focus, whether or not it's for cognitive endeavors or physical endeavors, is grounded in where we place our visual focus. Okay, What we look at and our ability to hold our concentration there is critically determining how we think. So in other words, if you can hold visual focus, you can hold mental focus, cognitive focus. But holding visual focus is challenging. It's tiring because it requires movement of the lens. And that movement of the lens requires activation of muscles. And the activation of muscles, as you know from the physical performance episodes, if you saw them and even if you don't, is dictated by neurons. When you look far away, okay, when you see things far away, your lens actually relaxes. It can flatten out. So I want you to think about this. When you look far away, when it may be anywhere from like 20 feet away from you out to a horizon that's miles or kilometers away from you, the lens can just relax. It can flatten out. And you'll notice that it actually is relaxing to look at a horizon. It's relaxing to look far away. Whereas if I look at something up close to me, like this pen or my phone or a computer screen or this microphone, it takes effort. You'll sense the effort. Now, some of that effort is actually eye movements because you have muscles that can move your eyes within their sockets. But a lot of the work, quote unquote, is neural work of the muscles having to, con to move and contract such that the lens actually gets thicker in order to bring the light to the retina and not to a location in front of it or behind it. I will say that there are a number of people that take lutein and some of these other things as a precautionary measure at, in order to bolster their health in the same way that some people take vitamins and minerals to bolster their health. And some people are very health, excuse me, and some people are very averse to taking vitamins and minerals because they feel like they can get all that from healthy whole foods. And of course, you can get these things from uh, from whole foods. The question is whether or not you can get them in concentrations that are sufficient. I do think that in the years to come, we are going to see more about lutein. So everything I've talked about today relates to studies that were done and published in quality peer-reviewed journals. That doesn't necessarily mean you want to run out and start taking the stuff that I've described or even doing the protocols I've described. I've given you an array, a palette, a buffet, if you will, of things that you could do to try and enhance or support your vision depending on how good your vision is, your uh, family history of vision and vision loss, your occupational hazards. You know, people that work with uh, metal filings that are flying out of machines are going to have a higher uh, degree of, of vision, um, you know, risk to their visual system than will people who just do office work. Although if you're doing a lot of office work, chances are you're not getting a lot of long view vision. Your accommodation mechanisms are going to start to suffer over time. I think we can reliably predict that. So I've tried to give you an array of behavioral tools and we did touch upon some supplementation tools. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that 
because blood flow is so critical for the neurons of the eye. Remember, these are the most metabolically active cells in your entire body, the cells within your retina, because blood flow is required to get them the energy and nutrients they need. Having a healthy cardiovascular system, right? Doing endurance work, doing strength training work regularly is going to support your eyes and your brain and your vision. It's indirect, but it's essential, right? It's necessary but it's not going to be sufficient. You're going to have to do other things to support your eyesight as well. But having a healthy cardiovascular system because it's going to deliver blood and oxygen and nutrients to this incredible apparatus on the front of your face, these two pieces of brain, is going to support your overall brain health and vision over time.